Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The show is about to begin. Okay, you're out. On the condition that you never enter your daughter in a beauty pageant in the state of California ever again. Ever. Welcome back to Three Guys in a Flick. This is where we review the good, the bad, and the absurd. Tonight's episode, Little Miss Sunshine. Beware. Spoilers. Coming to you from my basement, as always, my name is Don. And to my right, we have our comic book guy, John. How are you doing? And to my left, we have the professor. Hello. How are you guys doing tonight? Just traveling down the road of life. Traveling down the road of life. Nice, nice. Sir, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing well. Yeah? yeah. Uh, Little Miss Sunshine, this was the professor's pick, I believe. Yes, this is my road movie. Road movie. Uh, why'd you pick it? I picked it for a couple of reasons. One, I really enjoyed the movie from my recollection, and it had been several years since I'd seen it. The other reason is because it's a good road movie. Yeah. And we've all seen this before, right? Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. So basically, a road movie is one of those uh, movies about personal growth, development, and finding oneself as, you know, traveling down the road. Did we, did it meet all the criteria? I think it did. Oh, yeah, for sure. I, I like road movies because uh, the majority of the time spent is our protagonist traveling, uh, typically. Uh, not necessarily by a car maybe on a horse or walking or, but there's a journey that's being taken. And I really like, uh, if they do it right and it's well-written, you know, you get the bond between the characters if there is one. Um, and if it's a great story, uh, it's a great way to get you there. So I really enjoy road movies. Yeah. And I thought this was a great movie in that it's not only just a road movie, but it's a dark comedy. Yeah, it was super dark. It's It was way darker than I remembered. Yeah, so many bad things happen to this family, and a lot of things aren't even resolved about by the end, but you find yourself laughing the whole way through. It could almost be called a tragic comedy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it doesn't necessarily end on a tragic note. Yeah, it, but they're still going home bankrupt. Uh, they got to pay for funeral costs now. Yeah, but uh, and, Dwayne is talking. And Olive's big life ambitions. She's got to find new life ambitions. Dwayne's got to, you know, start over too. Yeah, but he's talking. That's a step forward. Uh, Frank seems to be. He hasn't dealt with his whole issues either. Well, so what? We don't care. So I'm just saying, it, no, nothing seems resolved by the end of this movie. Uh, well, Except uh, Olive can't compete in beauty pageants ever again. No, I think the, the moral of the story is that it brought the family together. Okay more together than it had been and and whatever state that looks like um you know is up to the imagination of the viewer but i took the ending as it wasn't your necessarily uh your picture perfect uh happy ending but yeah they're gonna be one happy family living on the street well as long as they're together living in their volkswagen you have to write you just answered the question without nobody knows what the question was what question? Whatever he held up. Oh, <laughs> well, went, that, yeah, of that, course. That, that is between uh, the professor and myself. Okay. Well, so. professor held up something and I didn't get to see what it was. All right. Um, <laughs> he asked me if I said spoilers. Oh. Oh, because we're I, talking about the end. I think he did. I do. He said there will that. always be spoilers. Yeah. Beware spoilers. And if they haven't figured that out by now, then apparently they haven't listened to yeah. any what of our other shows. What if it's their first show and they'd be like, oh. Well, they'll either turn it off or they'll continue as listening to us banter. Friendly so, banter. There you go. Um, I, I totally forgot that Alan Arkin died. Well, now um, you just spoiled it for me. Oh. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, he won the Academy Award, Best Supporting Actor. Yeah, for 2000, his mo- 2006. And he's only in like the first half of the movie or the first. Oh, he. I think when he dies, that's when we get into our third act. Yeah, I think our third act kind of starts when uh, they get pulled over, but we'll get there. 
Well, tell us a little about this movie. All right. It was released on January 20th uh, in 2006. It was directed by Jonathan Dayton and Valerie Ferris. Uh, it was written by Michael Arden. It stars Greg Kinnear, Steve Carell, Tony Collette, Paul Dano, Abigail Breslin, and Alan Arkin. Great cast. Yeah. A family determined to get their young daughter into the finals of a beauty pageant take a cross-country trip in their VW bus. It was made for $8 million and it grossed 101 that's not too shabby. That's not too shabby at all. Won a ton of awards. For a movie that took them something like five years to make, because I guess they were struggling a little bit. Yeah, it was on and off and on and off. The production was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a nice payoff, though. Cheryl Hoover is an overworked mother of two living in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Her brother, Frank, an unemployed scholar, is temporarily living with the family after having attempted suicide. Cheryl's husband, Richard, is trying to build a career as a motivational speaker and life coach. Dwayne, Cheryl's son from a previous marriage, is Nietzsche reading teenager who has taken a vow of silence until he can accomplish his dream of becoming a fighter pilot. Richard's foul-mouthed father, Edwin, recently evicted from a retirement home for snorting heroin, lives with the family. Olive, the daughter of Richard and Cheryl and the youngest of the Hoover family, is an inspiring beauty queen who is coached by Edwin. Olive learns she has qualified for the Little Miss Sunshine beauty pageant being held in Redondo Beach, California in two days. Richard, Cheryl, and Edwin want to support her, and Frank and Dwayne cannot be left alone, so the whole family goes. Because they have little money... They go on an 800-mile road trip in their yellow Volkswagen van. What did you think of the start of this movie? Uh, I, th- I like the opening. Uh, it's Richard's voiceover of the product that he's selling, the motivate the nine-step thing, and you have that song playing, and then you focus on... It keeps focusing on uh, different characters. I liked how they focused on Olive and how they... Uh, showed her watching the beauty pageant and that kind of puts you into her mind frame and it kind of got you where she's at. Uh, I thought it was a great opening. It is a fantastic opening. We open up close and tight on Olive's face and we are looking at her reflection of the television screen in her glasses and we are looking at an old beauty pageant and this old beauty pageant is what she aspires for in her own life, is to be a beauty queen herself. And she's trying to model herself into this, you know, this American dream, you know, of being the perfect, you know, the perfect beauty. And here she is trying to force herself into this. And then, go ahead. I was going to say, I kind of see where you're coming from, but I also kind of thought that maybe she's, interested because they're they're kind of showing you know richard talking about his you know nine step program at the same time olive is looking at the beauty pageant because she needs to be a winner to be accepted and approved of in her father's eyes and that's kind of you know she gets upset upset later on down the road but being afraid that she's not going to be a winner she's going to be a loser and she'll lose her father's love so i'm wondering if that's one of the reasons why she so desperately wanted to be a beauty queen winner. Because of her father? Because of her father. It was a hundred percent the reason. Is that what you got? Oh, absolutely. And and an impressionable seven year old, uh, daddy's little girl. All she yeah, absolutely. On the opposite side of that, we're we are now introduced to the mother, Tony Collette. Well, first we have Olive and then we go to Richard and we see Richard's sad little dream of wanting to be a winner and we see that his hope of becoming this winner is to this little pathetic crowd and he is languishing in his hopes of being a winner he's losing it being a winner yeah and then from there then we move to Dwayne and we see Dwayne and his frustrations before we go on did you catch the nine steps Just in case you want to be a winner? I did not. Yeah. According to the nine steps, Richard's nine steps. Number one, leaving loser head, find a new address in a winner-take-all world. Two, aspirations, inspirations, and perspiration. Three, no hocus-pocus, just focus. Four, 
Say no to the negheads. That one's for you, Don. Wait, wait, hang on, hang on, hang on. How many are there? There are nine. Uh, what number are we on? We just hit four. Okay. Number five, good enough is never good enough. Six, trust and be trusted. Seven, think big, act big, be big. Eight, reject rejection. And number nine, refuse to lose. I think he stole that from the Mariners. Oh, he might have. 2006? Yeah. Sure. Sure. Uh, who was the guy that wrote it? I don't know. Oh, but these are all words to live by. This is how we can be winners. So, yeah, he seemed to have a pretty successful uh, racket going not really. with those nine steps. He was trying to sell a book and all that, and he was kind of being a loser at trying to be a winner, telling everyone else to be a winner. Yeah. And then, yeah. We, and then we're introduced to Dwayne, and he's absorbed into his little world. After Dwayne, then we're introduced to Edwin, Grandpa, the, Richard's dad. Turns out that he's snorting drugs. So, yeah, there's another winner right there. And then after that, then we're introduced to Mom, Cheryl. And Cheryl, she's trying to hold everything together. But what do we focus on first when we see her? Her hand is on the steering wheel, and it has a cigarette. And then within 10 seconds, Richard is accusing her of smoking. She says, no, I'm not smoking. She throws it out the window. And then after that, we are introduced to Frank sitting dejected, lonely, looking out the window. And then we get little Miss Sunshine looking at Steve Carell's depressed face. And it is a cruel irony to look at that title against Steve Carell. This is a great opening. It introduces all of our characters in their own separate, isolated, broken worlds. Well put. Well described. Now, did you catch uh, Steve Carell wearing all white? Like the reasons why for that? I went around. Because he was in the loony bin? I mm. went around and around with that. Why do you have Steve Carell dressed in all white? Early on in the van, he is wearing a light lavender shirt, but pretty soon he sheds it, and we are able to see that he has the white on underneath. And eventually, it's like, there's got to be a reason for him being in the white shirt. And it dawned on me that this is symbolism that this movie has a lot of. There is a lot of symbolism mm -hmm. in this movie. It, it is not an oversight. It is not an accident that Frank is all white. Do you have any thoughts as to why he could be wearing all white? Nope. I had to look it up. It is meant to symbolize Frank's rebirth. And that he's, he's basically, after he tried to kill himself, now the world is brand new to him. He's... He's innocent, he's naive, he's starting over, he's at the bottom, he's been reborn. So everything, everything that's happening to him throughout this movie is rebuilding his character. And not just himself, but he is also there to help this family rebuild themselves. Mm -hmm. Wow, look at you guys. It, well, like I said, it was, why is he in white? And it, it had, it's, it's no accident. And, and so, yeah, you know, he is there. He is back from death, right? He, he, why are you wearing those bandages, right? It's like, I even forgot about that. But all of, she points it out, you know, at the, at the, at the dinner table. I love that dinner table scene. Yeah, <clears throat> it got real awkward real quick, but it wasn't so awkward that you couldn't watch. Uh, it was very well written, uh, uh, it was very well performed. It made me want to eat chicken. Oh, I, oh, oh, I, when I see stuff like that, I always want KFC. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I want KFC right now. <laughs> Finger looking good. Fuck yeah. yeah. But um, hopefully we have them as an endorsement for this, or they could sponsor us. Oh, wouldn't that be something? Uh, do you ever if see, you're listening, do you ever see Talladega Nights? I have. Yes. Uh, when they're eating dinner, it's just Domino's. Uh, Jack in a Box, KFC. No, they have two, uh, a couple of two liters. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be nice. But that yeah, nice. The, the the dinner scene is is written very well. The the tension yeah. and uh, it is played so well. All of all of the characters are played so so well. Yeah, let's talk about Steve Carell for a second. Steve Carell hit it out of the fucking park. Man, he should have been nominated for this role. Oh. Oh, he would have gone up against Alan Arkin. That would have been tough. But yeah, but but I got to tell you, he he was gold in this role. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. He's such a good actor. He's not only funny, but he can do the serious bits. You could feel the depression in him. Oh yeah, yeah. He did a great job. 
great job. When uh, Cheryl comes in and he's sitting in the wheelchair, she says, uh, I'm so glad you're with us still or, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, glad you're alive. Yeah. yeah. And he says. Well, one of us are. Yeah. Well, that makes one of us. Yeah. You know, it was just, it was good. And he, with the opening title card, you know, it, it, it was good stuff. He did an amazing portrayal of just a man who's given up. Yeah. And just doesn't care anymore. He definitely really uh, pulled me into the movie more because I felt drawn to him, especially when he's sitting at the table there with Dwayne. I, 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 my eyes were just locked on him. Yeah. I thought Greg Kinnear did an amazing job at just being a dick. Greg Kinnear did do, did do a good job. He was certainly an asshole. I could have recasted him. Mm-hmm. I think that if, you, if, if we kind of played the game, let's recast it. It wouldn't have it wouldn't have bothered me. It won't bother me recasting Greg Kinnear. Everyone else can stay because they all did outstanding. Well, they had originally three other people in mind. Oh, hit me. They had Robin Williams, which is one that they really wanted. I can't see him in that role. No. They had Alec Baldwin. I can see that. And they had David Duchovny. Those are the three people that they were looking at to play Richard. Out of those three, I guess... You you got to go with Robin Williams? They even o- offered the part to Thomas Hayden Church, uh, and he turned it down. Ray Romano wanted to be in it as well as Richard. I, I, could, th- I could see David Duchovny playing a, a, an asshole in this. Yeah, yeah, I can take David Duchovny or take, Yeah, I, I feel you. But yeah. why Robin Williams? I wonder. I don't. I can't see him playing a asshole character like that. I mean, unless it's just a different. Oh, I can. I think Robin Williams could play anything. I think he would have been a better Frank. Not better than I think, you know, Steve Carell did. But I think he could have played that part well. Sure. And again, I think Robin Williams could have played any of the parts. He could have played all of. I could see it. He's that good, right? Or he was that good. Rest in peace. But yeah, I Greg Kinnear was kind of maybe the weak link for me in, in the cast. And every time he was on screen, I... I could take it or leave it. He um, he definitely did play the asshole very well, and you know he's he's trying to get this business off the ground. He he has this deal in the works, and he doesn't know if it's going to go through. So he's waiting for uh, for a call from Stan Grossman, and that's kind of a plot point of the movie. And so after this opening, we get home with Cheryl, who brings Frank to the house, and then uh, Richard comes home at the same time, and so now we're we're in this in this setting and Olive finds out or there's a uh, message on the answering machine mm-hmm. and that Olive has been selected to go participate in little miss sunshine because the person who won the crown in her, in her contest uh, got disqualified. They said something about steroids. Did you ever listen to the message something on the about machine? Per- performance and answers. Yeah. S- something like that. And mm-hmm. you're thinking for a beauty pageant? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Fuck yeah, of course. So naturally, all of and we get takes her place. 30 second scream. Oh, that's such a great scream. So the family, despite their differences, they unite for Olive because they can't fly. It's too expensive. And none Cher- of them can be left alone. Well, Cheryl doesn't want to drive the V-dub because she doesn't really know how to drive a manual. So... Uh, Richard says he'll go and then it just kind of snowballs and then uh, Richard's dad has to go and then Dwayne and Frank, of course, are are made to go as well. So we're all going to California. Road trip. In a Volkswagen van. A buddy of mine's mom used to have a Volkswagen van. I can see it. My wife wants one. Does she really? Oh yeah, she loves them. Oh, that's hilarious. When the van breaks down early on, the family learns they must push the van until it is moving at about 20 miles an hour before they can put it into gear, at which point they have to run up the side door and jump in. Later on, the van's horn starts honking unceasingly by itself, which leads to the family being pulled over by a state trooper. What would you think about just all the things with the van going wrong? But at any point, would you have just said trip over? And it's hard to say if I, if I had to put myself in that spot and if it was Elise and it was her dream and oh, I'd still go on, I would probably go through everything that guy went through uh, for his daughter. Although I think I would have handled things differently. Well, both of you have daughters. Would you let your daughters be in a beauty pageant like this or would you try to discourage it? That's a, that's a tough question because 
if you have a little one that has motivations and desires and passions for something that they are engaged in that makes their face light up, I don't want to quash that. Ditto. You know, it's that little face that makes you want to get out of bed every morning Mm -hmm. until they're 14 and then you want to throw them out the fucking window. That's a different story for a different time. If if it was something that she really wanted to do, yeah, I'd totally be into but, it. But looking at you know what the how the beauty, beauty pageants are handled and the different people are in it and the the way the expectations, I make the, they make them come out in swimsuits I, in the beginning. I, well, I would hope that it's at creepy. some point she would lose interest, okay. and mm-hmm. then you know mm-hmm. save me a bunch of money. So when they are out on the road, they stop at a diner, and the diner has a wonderful scene in it that is just one of the first moments that we see the family start to have a glimmer of hope for each other, whereas before they were absorbed in their own little place. And I'm talking about the ice cream. Richard is showing you know, what a dick he can be when he puts even more pressure on Olive not to eat the ice cream because you know winners aren't fat, apparently. Miss America contestants aren't fat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and he keeps pushing that throughout the entire film because he believes it. He's trying to sell that very notion. And if he can't live and walk the dream, then... The American dream of... That's right. And so he, he's pushing it. Unfortunately, <laughs> he's doing it to a seven-year-old girl. I mean, she has her whole life ahead of her. And, I mean, come on, guy. Come but, on. And, and I get it. There are parents out there... That, I mean, look at these pageants in real life. I mean, they're insane. They are l- literally insane. And so I would hope that if any of our daughters got involved, they would lose interest. But yeah, he's he's a dick. Did you ever watch that show, Toddlers and Tierras? I've seen like a couple episodes, maybe. I had no desire to watch that. Watch it, it is scary what they do to those kids and how serious the parents take it. They don't even care if the kids enjoy it. They just force those kids into it. Yeah, well, see, there I think it's the parents. I mean, the little little kids, the little girls, they wear doll teeth so that they can have these perfect teeth. They, you know, spend all their time tanning and getting their hair done and getting all these little costumes and all that makeup. It's just so much pressure for like a little girl. Exactly. And that, that sounds expensive. And that mm-hmm. and that's what we have in this scene with the ice cream. Yeah. Is Olive going to conform to the standards of what is considered to be beautiful or is she going to do what makes her happy? And the rest of them at the table, so the ice cream shows up, Olive dejectedly says, does anybody want my ice cream? And then Edwin, God bless him, he's like, oh yeah, I'd love to have some. And then Frank jumps in right afterwards and then they all... Show, show Richard. Richard, that's wrong. And then from there, I give you my ice cream, and she just gives in to her own happy, her own happiness, and she's not going to conform to you know what America and what you know people say is beautiful. Right. I thought this was just a good moment that we see the family come together first, where they're not absorbed into their own their own selves. Now, granted. Cheryl, she's not like that as much. But Richard, he's always hyper-focused on just him and his project. Mm-hmm. And and Richard, I, I feel like that he's just angry about everything. And, and certainly Dwayne, no. This is the first time we start to see Frank come out. He's starting to thaw a little bit. Yeah. And so I, I thought this was a, a good scene that started to show how we perceive what is important and not this shallowness. I like that when the family does come together, it, it is a, a bondy moment and kind of a, a, a victorious moment for Olive because she gets to get her ice cream. She eats her ice cream, which is fantastic. I want to talk about the scene where we rewind it a little bit back at the house when Frank is sharing his room with Dwayne and it's time for them to go to, they're going to bed and Dwayne writes down on a piece of paper, uh, don't kill yourself tonight. And I love the reaction that Frank gives him. I wouldn't do that to you. Yeah, and the response. And I was thinking about that, and I probably would have done the same thing because I I don't want to worry about it while I'm trying to sleep, right? Mm -hmm. So, And I thought that was a brilliant moment, and it it shaped or it's starting to shape the relationship between Dwayne and Frank, which I think is so very important for this movie as well. They are strong characters that end up kind of leading the family. Yeah. You know, there was a deleted scene with them surfing. I'm glad that that wasn't a part of it. Yeah. I would have thought, wait a minute. Olive is 
in the pageant right now. How in the world do they have time to get on surfboards and go out into the water? That seems like too much time. The reason why it was cut was because the day that they were filming, the water was tricky enough, but a couple of school buses with about 100 school kids showed up, and they were constantly peeling and squealing and laughing and screaming. Lucky for us and everyone else, the kids showed up. Do you think they would have used it? I don't know. It has a lot to do with what they would have talked about. There's a couple of deleted scenes that are in the movie that ultimately I am glad that they were left behind because the scenes, even though they are endearing between Frank and Dwayne, they are also scenes that subtly hold the characters down. They do not lift the characters up as much. It's easy to see. There's a lot of bonding points in this movie Mm -hmm. where the family's coming together. The ice cream scene and the first scene where I think they're pushing, I mean, in, at this point, where they're pushing the Volkswagen bug or Volkswagen van to uh, get fast enough so that they can jump in. I almost saw that one as the stronger bonding point than the ice cream because that one, they were all working together. You know what's funny about that scene? This is the second week in a row we have watched a movie with Julio Oscar Menchosos. Hmm. I wasn't aware of that. He was in Once Upon a Time in Mexico. Oh. What did he play in Mexico? He was the rat, the guy who sells out the president. Oh, yeah. Hmm. That's him. He had no hair in this one. He was the mechanic in this one? He's the mechanic in this one. Oh, right on. Yeah. 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 So I love that, that uh, the van breaks down. They take it to the mechanic. How long is it going to take? He says, Thursday. And they're like, no, that, that can't be right. And then they come up with a solution. So the van is another large symbolic uh, reference point in this movie. The van is representing the struggles that the family is going through and the the struggle that, that each one of these characters are having, it's symbolic to their characters. And so each person is, is struggling on their own And in my opinion, the van will only go when they all work together and by themselves. They Mm. can't make themselves go. But if they all work together and they think about each other, then it is all of them together that makes them go. That's why why we call him the professor. Yeah, I love it. That's deep. Well done. And if you think about the color of the van as well, the movie is called Little Miss Sunshine. And sunshine in general, is considered to be, you know, optimistic and happy, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the van is broken, it has scuffs on it, and it breaks down along the way. And by the end of the movie, it's still no better, but it still works. Yeah, I can see that because every character in this uh, thing is broken in some way or has a breakdown, At some point in the movie, even Olive does when she's talking to her grandpa and talks about she doesn't want to be a loser Mm -hmm. yeah, because her dad won't love her. I love the relationship between Olive and her grandpa. When Cheryl gets home in the beginning of the movie, she yells for Olive, what are you doing downstairs? Is grandpa with you? Yeah, we're rehearsing. It's always we're rehearsing. And when we watched it, I totally forgot what the routine was. For some reason, I had uh, the Blind Melon song in my head. and the You little, thought of a little Bumblebee yeah, outfit? Yeah, the little Bumblebee dancing around. And I don't know why that entered my head, but it, that's uh, that's what I thought. So what when she came out and ultimately did what she did, that was fucking awesome. Yeah. But I, we'll get there. I loved their relationship as well until the hotel scene. And then uh, at the end of that scene, I no longer liked Grandpa. Okay. I was mad at him. Okay, but... We read about, we read in our notes that Grandpa OD'd. Yes. I did not take it that way when I watched the movie both times. I understand that he got his drugs out after he said goodbye and he went into the bathroom, but I did not take it as him OD'ing, especially because I didn't see him getting high, but I knew that he was going to get high in conjunction with the doctor said, I think he just passed away in, in his sleep. It was too much. No, she, the doctor said it was too much for him to take, is what the doctor had said to the family, right, which I took it as he took too much heroin. I took it as the years of abuse that he 
put on his heart mm-hmm. and his body finally caught up with him. That's, and it was, that's and, how and, I and it could it. have been absolutely, yeah. it could have been one bad trip and he could have OD'd, or maybe it was his time and his heart just gave out. I don't know. Maybe, but, it, maybe, yeah, maybe he just gave out. I mean, what upset me was, you know, you're in charge, you're, you're in charge of your granddaughter for the night. She wants to stay with you in a hotel room. You don't do heroin. Oh, you, you, you are responsible. If you, if, if you sent your daughter to stay with your father, and then you found out he did heroin that night while he was looking after her. Wouldn't you be a little pissed off? Is he still alive the next morning? Either way. If he if he died because he did something like that, irresponsible like that, while watching your daughter, you might have some hard feelings. Well, yeah, I'm sure I would. But I would probably know if my dad was doing heroin. Um, well, they knew he but got, you kicked can't, but you, they yeah, got but, kicked out of the thing because he was doing heroin. It was drugs and heroin. Do they... Was it heroin they, that he was doing? They said he was kicked out of the home for snorting heroin. That's what they said. That, that That's what Grandpa said in the van. Yeah. He says that. The way he chops it up and uses it, it looks like Coke, but See, I See, that's what I was thinking, too. So that, I I didn't know you did that with heroin. I, I would have thought that was Coke. Yeah, so did I. And it even came in the little Coke vial that we used to see in Miami Vice. Mm-hmm. Remember those? Mm-hmm. I, yeah. is, isn't, I believe, heroin a version of Coke just cook differently oh i have no idea me neither oh see this is where we need professor professor you need to look these things up for us didn't you do a lot of coke in the 70s uh oh no i guess it would have been 80s no didn't you do a lot of coca-cola oh coca-cola coca-cola that's right that's what what gave me a heart attack see coke will kill you see see i'm doing coke tonight (sighs) you guys just make me edit this shit and it drives me nuts so uh, I also love <laughs> the, the the little moment of foreshadowing, little moment of foreshadowing that happens when uh, Olive and Grandpa are doing their little and they're crawling. You think they're just playing, but that's a part of the dance routine at the end. Oh, it absolutely. Her growl. Is. Yep. Yeah. Throughout the road trip, the family suffers numerous personal setbacks and discover their need for each other's support. Richard loses an important contract that would have jump-started his motivational business. Frank encounters the ex-boyfriend who, in leaving him for an academic rival, had prompted his suicide attempt. Edwin dies from a heroin overdose, resulting in the family smuggling the body out of the hospital and nearly having it discovered by the police. During the final leg of the trip, Dwayne discovers that he is colorblind, which means he cannot become a pilot prompting him to finally break his silence and shout his anger and disdain for his family. Olive calms him with a hug, and he immediately apologizes. So, so is, there, is there a term, a film term, for when like all the issues are being resolved or in the process of being resolved, like that point in the movie? Resolution. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought there'd be some fancy, fancy uh, term. So okay. um, I it didn't bother me that much, but... Um, all of grandpa won't wake up. How'd she get in the room? I guess she I was thinking the same thing. I was thinking, did they give her an extra key? Did yeah, they not exactly. lock the door? They might have not locked the doors in between the two rooms. That's well, were they adjoining rooms? Maybe. Yeah, remember they when they all went into the rooms, they were all next door to each other. That doesn't mean they were adjoining from the inside. That's what I'm saying. They're, I assume so. Maybe they were, but yeah, I was thinking that. How did you get in the room? Yeah, maybe. I liked, uh, see, I thought. Because it was written that way. <laughs> there you go. We haven't used that one yet. I thought that she was waking them up because he overslept, because he made such a big deal. You know, 7 a.m., we got to be on the road by 7.45, no later. And I thought that she was waking him up because they were late. I completely did not see Alan Arkin dying. And I had seen the movie. So, so that slapped you across the face. That really slapped me across the face. And I went, oh, that sucks. And then I thought, they won't kill him. They'll go to the hospital. They're ba- they will barely make it, blah, blah, blah. But no, they, they killed him off and there's, there's a bold g- choice. There, there's a great shot right before the doctor comes out where the family is sitting together. And uh, Cheryl is telling all of uh, about, or maybe she hasn't said it just yet. It's right before the doctor comes out. Frank is on the left, and then Cheryl, and then Dwayne, Olive, and then Richard is standing. And Dwayne writes on his pad, go give mom a hug. And so there is Dwayne 
reaching out to mom the only way he can right now, which is through Olive. Frank touches his sister's leg and she comforts and, and she is comforted by his hand touching her. Richard stays right frame and his shadow casts long onto the wall and It is only his shadow that reaches the family, and he continues to look away, but it is only his shadow on the wall above the family. So everybody is connecting with Mom, but Richard is still not connected yet. I really liked, uh, throughout this movie, Cheryl's blatant honesty in the way she talked to Olive. She was just clear. She was okay with Frank telling his story. You know, every even the death scene, she's basically saying, you know, you know, is, is grandpa dead? Is grandpa going to die? Well, he may have gone to heaven. Yeah. Whereas Richard, on the other hand, his whole character is keeping everybody in the dark. I mean, he wants to, you know, hide the suicide attempt from her. He's not okay talking about death. He's not, ta- you know. Which is ironic because he pretty much calls, pretty much tells her he, he, he doesn't want her to be fat. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, I mean, you're right. He does try to shelter her in that, that scene where they're talking about the suicide attempt that we talked about. Uh, yeah, he was totally trying to... Uh, Whitewash it. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, And so um, the body is then smuggled out of the hospital. John had a morbid question that he gave us when we were watching it, which I did not ask my wife for well, those of you that are listening, I think maybe you might be able to guess what the question is that John asked us. And so I posed the question to the wives, if we were going to smuggle a body out of a hospital, would you help us? And I, I'm proud to say two out of the three would help us. Ken, how did your wife- Oh, no, 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 no. There were stipulations. Oh, yeah, your wife in, did have a stipulation. In, in that instance, so did yours. Neither of them would have helped us get that body out the window. Well, they said that they wouldn't take it out of a hospital. St- stipulations. Yeah. The, you got to put yourself in the scene, right? You that's Would they help you do that? That is love. No. Yeah, they said that they wouldn't help us smuggle in the hospital, but I know my wife said she'd help me hide a body. Okay, you're, you know, yeah, and, and true. However, same ballpark is not really the same thing. Okay. It's a little bit like that, that old joke about, you know, a good friend will help you move. A very good friend will help you move a body. Yeah. Uh, A good friend will bail you out of jail. A best friend will be sitting right next to you going, fuck, that was fun. (laughs) Well, I never did ask Maggie, so I don't know what she'd say. I I, I really don't know. So there you have it. So now it's off to the pageant. Well, before we get there, what did you think of the scene when they get to the gas station and... Edwin sends in Frank to get the porn. Oh, I I thought it was uh, Edwin being Edwin. Yeah, I just so thought I'd, Frank was like, okay. Yeah, and and Frank's character it was kind of like that throughout the yeah. entire thing. Just the way he had conversations with people, and just the way he interacted with people. He that was awesome, and I felt that him running into his ex boyfriend was a little bit too convenient. It was too contrived. Well, it was a convenient store. <laughs> good one but yuck, 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 yuck. but my my issue with that and again it's just the magic of the way this movie works is even though how awkward that whole thing was he's got the porn and he's running into the guy that you know basically led to his suicide attempt and hiding the guy that his, he, hiding his bandages yeah, and the other guy that he absolutely hates is outside it's still a funny scene they still created laughter in that awkward horrible well, it's fu- it's funny when Frank leans to the left to shield the counter. Mm-hmm. So yeah, to block the the to porn block. mags. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I just felt that it was too convenient, and yes, it was a funny scene, and Steve Carell played it perfectly. Could we have done without it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so the scene where Dwayne finds out that he is colorblind is. I think a very important scene in the movie because this is where Dwayne finally hits bottom. We have seen Richard already hitting bottom when he didn't get the book deal. Grandpa definitely hit bottom and he didn't come back from that. He did. He did. (laughs) Yeah. And then uh, Frank 
he is back from his lowest point, and now Dwayne is experiencing his lowest point on his colorblind test, innocently given by all of shatters his entire future. I thought they, I thought that wasn't serious at first. I thought when he, you know, couldn't see it, or I thought he was just playing around or whatever, and then it hit it hit me that he was going to be colorblind. And the first thing I thought was he's not going to be able to fly. And I, again, I completely forgot about this scene. Really? Oh, it was such a good scene. It, yeah, it, it's, it's a really pivotal scene for Dwayne and the way it was shot. I, it has my favorite shot when he, when he finally exits the van and he runs down the hill and he's in the foreground and the van is up on top of the hill with the family standing there uh, against the blue skyline. And symbolically, we have Dwayne at his lowest point. And then Cheryl, mom, comes down, and she comes most of the way down, but she can't get all the way down to him, and she doesn't know what to do, so she goes back up. And finally, it is little Olive. She is the one that is able to reach Dwayne, and she does the same thing that she did to mom. She just gives him a hug. Yeah, and that, and that was after Dwayne lost his shit on his mom, mm-hmm. right? He yells at her, yeah. tells her about the divorce, yeah. the suicide, this, that. And I mean, he just vomits yeah. all over her with an emotional yeah. rage. Yeah. And all that pent up, because he hadn't been talking for months. Oh, yeah. I think they said he, a year. He had taken a vow of silence and he'd been, hadn't been talking for almost a year. Is that it, what it was? It, I, it was? I knew it was, I knew it was quite long, a bit of time. Yeah, yeah, it was a long time. Yeah, this yeah, is so. the point where Dwayne joins the broken. You know, everybody else has kind of been broken at some point, in tears at some point. The only one who I'm I think not... He, I think he was always broken. But he, he didn't really, you know, he just didn't talk. So you didn't know what was ever bothering him or what was wrong. Oh, I could tell he you. He just wasn't talking. I no, could tell you I, exactly what was wrong and with him. And it was him. because he wanted to be, he was taking a vow of silence so that he could focus on his dream. It, it, no, it, he is frustrated with the perceptions of society and what society expects of him. And he wants nothing to do with any of that. And he thinks that society in general is broken and people are a waste of time. And he's misguided by his readings and he doesn't understand the suffering that Nietzsche goes through is not what he thinks it is which is that people are, are wrong and bad and everything is terrible. And, and we get a perception, a different perspective introduced to us a little bit later. But I'd like to add one last little part. When he comes back up and he climbs back up the hill, that's himself climbing back up under, that's him choosing to rejoin, right? He, he, he pulls himself back up. And what does he do when he gets up to the van? He immediately apologizes to everybody. Yeah. At what point in the movie would you say Cheryl hits her lowest point and that she kind of joins the broken? Well, again, I think she's broken already too. Yeah, but the, the, but is she at her low point throughout the whole movie? Or do you think it's in that hospital scene where she breaks down in tears? Um, I was trying to figure out what... Because everybody hits their lowest point in this movie. What is hers? I felt like she didn't necessarily have a lowest point, but... I felt like that she was just barely crawling along. And Frank's lowest point came before the movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it also could have come at the point where he was in the convenience store. That was lower than him trying to kill himself? Because it all was thrown back in his face again. He'd finally started to find happy again with his family, and he was having a good time, and he was smiling as he was going to buy the porn. But he didn't. And then right back then, he's dragged back down. But he didn't go back outside and try to kill himself. No. I think at that point, you have to be at your lowest. But. Who knows if the family wasn't there, the family wasn't involved and he had run into that situation. Maybe he would have tried to get Right. It. I'm just saying that I don't think the convenience store is his lowest point. Yeah. I, I, I didn't, I didn't get that either. I thought the convenience <laughs> store was convenient. Well, the movie could also could have basically started at Frank's lowest point and he started building up right in the beginning of the movie when he was sitting on that bed. We got him after. So. We got him after the attempt. The yeah. attempt has to be the lowest point. Okay. I would think. So. Yeah, and yeah, the, the I I think the entire family is already broken. We already we already they are a very well, dis- they're a broken family. I'm they're just a very to think dysfunctional right. family, hitting low points throughout the movie. Yeah, sure. And Olive's would have been when she was talking with Grandpa and crying. Mm, maybe, 
After a frantic race against the clock, the family arrives at the pageant hotel and are curtly told by a pageant organizer that they are a few minutes past the deadline. A sympathetic hired hand named Kirby instead offers to register Olive on his own time. As Olive prepares for the pageant, the family sees Olive's competition. Slim, hypersexualized preteen girls with teased hair and capped teeth, performing highly elaborate dance numbers. It becomes apparent that Olive is an amateur by comparison. As Olive's turn to perform in the talent portion draws near, Richard and Duane worry that Olive will be humiliated and wanting to spare her feelings, run into the dressing room and try and talk her out of performing. Cheryl, however, insists that they let Olive be Olive, and Olive goes on stage. Olive's dance that Edwin had taught her is revealed to be a striptease performed to the revamped version of Rick James' Super Freak. Despite the other girls being hypersexualized, Olive's burlesque performance scandalizes and horrifies most of the audience and the organizers, who demand Olive be removed from the stage. Instead of removing her, one by one, the family members of the Hoover family join Olive, dancing alongside her to show their support. The family completes the dance to a shocked and silent audience, save for a biker dad, Kirby and Miss California, who cheer enthusiastically. So I'd like to talk about when they first get to the hotel when they first arrive at the hotel and they, they bust through the chains and the, the van screeches to a halt. They open up the door, the door falls off. Mm -hmm. And then we have Frank immediately he full tilt fast as he can. He is doing the, he is thinking nothing. He is, he, he has finally left himself and his, and his woes and, all of the all of the broken things about him he has left that behind and he is now present at this time for the family with this family and he is giving himself completely that he will no matter what get her olive into the pageant even though the deadline is happening right now and it, i i love that selfless little moment because nobody tells him to go he just goes and I feel like that that is when, when Frank finally transforms himself and brings himself into the present, and he is now current with the family, together with them. I loved that scene. I thought that Steve Carell, I mean, it's such, it's such a simple gesture. They pull up, and first of all, how they get to the hotel is fucking hilarious. They Driving get, down they, the, the path. And he, totally, he totally went one exit too far to get to that hotel, but fuck, damn it, they made it work, and he was cutting, and I was thinking to myself, that's what I would do. I would get off somewhere and just go through the the parking lots and do what he did, and it was it was incredible. And then when Julie and, and I have done things just like that, oh, I can imagine. And when they get there and the door falls off, and then Steve Carell just takes off. It's such a great moment because you're right. By God, he will get her registered. And of course, in true drama fashion, she's too late. And they're and then finally the rest of the family gets to the table and their uh, the dad is pleading and begging. Gets I mean, on his he knees. He gets on his knees and he begs this uh pageant lady to let Olive in. And and you know, that's for as much of a dick that he is, you you got to think that he does love his daughter. I he, think, he got her there. I think with his dead dad in his Richard's big turning point where I saw him becoming less of a dick was when his dad told him he was proud of him. Do you remember that scene right before the dad oh, yeah. died? That mm -hmm. was a great scene. Um, where, you know, and that was so out of left field for Edwin's character. Because Edwin's character was just kind of this brass. He cussed. He talked about sex. He, he was, didn't give a fuck. He didn't care about anything. But when Richard was at his lowest and had lost the deal. There he was. His father told him, you know what? You tried. You did your best. And I'm proud of you. Most people wouldn't have even gone as far as you had. Yeah. And I think to that at that point, Richard realized words matter. I like to think that in some way, all dads would be like that. Yeah. No matter how crass or what, no matter an asshole that they can be. I like to think that when your kids need you the most, you're there. And I, th I think you're right. I think it does kind of turn Greg Kinnear. Because at first, after he gives him the compliment, tells him he's proud of him, he's like, yeah, thanks, Dad. And right. then he goes, no, no, I mean it. I mean it. And then you could you can see the emotion kind of mm -hmm. wash over Greg Kinnear's face. And then, and then he gives him a genuine, thanks, Dad. You know, you're fucking killing me with that phone, Hammond. 
Um, I thought I turned it down. I'm just kidding. Um, So, but yeah, that's kind of where I saw a turning point in Richard's character. Oh, I agree. Uh, That and, if I can tack on to that, when he goes to make the deal, when he takes the little scooter and he meets Brian Cranston, who is a great cameo. I guess it's not a cameo for him then. But anyways, uh, I think that's, and after he loses it and he doesn't get the deal, I think that also starts to shape his his uh, perspective on things yeah, as well. Because he's going to do it anyway. Right. He's going to do it without him because he doesn't say no. Yeah, because, you know, refuse to lose. Right. Number nine. Number nine, refuse to lose. And it's important that he is starting to realize that he, fuck me. <laughs> That he fucks you? It is important that he is also realizing that he cannot live up to his own standard, his own definition of what it is to the definition of the word of being successful. 100%. Let, let's talk about this dance routine for a minute. Which was awesome. Oh, it was so funny. And again, I didn't put two and two together because I, for some reason, I don't remember the movie. But anyways, uh, you see her in the back getting ready and she has like this shirt and tie, like a full on suit on. And I'm thinking, and and I remember the growling. And so I knew it was going to be something, something along those lines. But when she comes out and it's super freak and which is prefaced by the guy who lets them in, he, he runs back and goes, this is. This, Give me your music. This is this is your music. Yeah, did my, what'd she say? Oh, my grandpa helped me pick it out. The funny thing is, if you think about it, and you think of grandpa's character, you know, at that point it was almost like an aha moment because grandpa's teaching her to a dance routine. What would grandpa know about dance routines except for going to strip clubs? Maybe. So it just for me, it was like, oh, now it makes sense why grandpa's teaching her a dance routine. That's the dance routine he knows. Yeah. See, I, 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 I never thought of that. I just thought of their, their established relationship uh, as grandpa is just being grandpa. And he, the, the, he, she always says, you know, I'm working on the, uh, I'm rehearsing, I'm working on the bit. And so I always assumed that it was both their ideas and they came up with it together. But when you see it, it totally fits the grandpa's character a hundred percent. And it's hilarious. And the one thing I love most about that scene is as she's stripping and or taking off her clothes and, uh, everybody is kind of freaking out. Miss California is sitting there bouncing and having a great time. So I was thinking before I got too far into it, I was thinking maybe she does win. Maybe she does move on or something like that. And then, you know, what happens happens, but I love the fact that she was bouncing along, having a good time. And also the guy who, who let him in and was getting, and and, and, and the handler, she, the handler wearing the headset. Yes. 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 She had a smile on her face. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I loved Miss California smiling the whole time with it. Yeah. So that that was a fun scene and another family bonding moment. They all came to Olive's rescue because she had come to her mom's rescue. She had come to her brother's rescue. Uh, don't know if she really came to her grandpa or her dad that mm-hmm. we saw, but you know it was their turn to support Olive in this moment, even though they had gone on this whole fucking trip because of Olive. But it was a great moment and. Uh, I, when the pageant lady told Kinnear to get your daughter off the stage and he kind of walks up to her, I was thinking to myself, what would I do in that situation? Because I can imagine just the heartbreak and the look. If, if I stopped, you know, at least from doing her routine, mid-routine, and just stopped her and said, okay, we got to go, I, I can just imagine you know how she would look at me i could see you dancing with her and see and that's you know i i i, yeah, I like to think you. that that's You're what that i would like to do kind of dad when you see his head start to bob back and forth just a little bit it's yep like, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no and, and to, of the two of you hemin would have been the better dancer because he would have gone all out i could see you really getting into it better dancer than me <laughs> the professor would be swinging his shirt over his head i mean he would be all into it yeah, maybe. I can see it. I can see it. Now, to to go into the power of like nonverbal cues, you know, up until this point, you were kind of wondering if at the end of the movie, if Cheryl and Richard are going to get a divorce. But then you see Richard go up on stage and start dancing with his daughter and you see Cheryl out in the audience. And all of a sudden that little smile on her face says, this family's going to be okay. 
See, I I thought that because of the deal, that would have uh, kind of led more toward divorce, right? Because well, he when, when, no, yeah, yeah. Well, when they got to the hotel and they were having that argument, up until the moment where he says, "Well, I'm going to go do it anyway," and he leaves, because I think that reaffirms to her that he, he's into it. Or mm-hmm. he's he's in for the long haul. So I don't know if I ever questioned them getting divorced toward the end of the film. I, I don't know. I thought I, they were broken until I, that I, point. I, I didn't think that they were going to be divorced, but they, you know, when we see them sitting on the bed with their backs to each other, we knew that they were definitely on their own little frustrated little angry island. I, I think that for uh, the moment that Richard starts to have the realization as he's watching the beauty pageant, and he's watching all, all, all these other little girls as, as they're going through. I, I think that, you know, Richard, the realization that, you know, this highly specific and very narrow expectation that society has put upon all of us, these little girls, that this is what beauty is. And he has a very specific view on what success is. And we see it starting to melt away. And he realizes that this is not right. And he is, and he's making that transformation that he needs to change himself as well, that this isn't good. And he knows that all, all of wants is to be joyful and to perform. And, and that's what's important. That's what matters. It's not what all of these people, all these phony people in here, it's not, that's not the important thing anymore. It's not about that. Yeah. Well, this movie was created based off of a quote by Arnold Schwarzenegger that he gave to some high schoolers. The writer had overheard or had read an article where Arnold had said to some kids, if there's one thing in this world that I hate, it's a loser. I despise them. So the writer wanted to make a movie that went against that idea. And I think that's what this point in this movie really represents is that all of is going to lose. She's going to be a loser in this competition, but by losing, the family won. Wow, that's deep. So it kind of, it goes against everything Richard had, you know, talked about in his whole thing. It was lose to win. And, and this is also brought about when he goes backstage and he is trying to get uh Cheryl to don't don't let her do this. And then to have Frank and Dwayne show up. It's funny how they go in after talking on the pier, they're in there for 10 seconds. They come back out. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah Cause they knew and, and they the, saw it. And then they and go back and they try to tell, no, don't let her do this. Yeah. They were so supportive up until seeing what the competition really was. And then they were like, yeah, you can't let her do this. You can't let her do this. And you know what? Good for Cheryl. Good for the mom saying, no, we have to let Olive be Olive. And that is the ultimate joy that Olive and, exudes right and sure olive may be disappointed and may not ever do a beauty pageant again but she'll have that experience and did she ever slow down her dance once not once she didn't miss a beat she just kept dancing because she, her grandfather taught her well oh and i love that little moment i'd like to dedicate this to my grandfather oh where's your grandfather he's in the trunk love that and and now once we get everybody up on the stage, you know, that's where we see that the family has finally come together and, and they are dancing in, in this joy that they have overcome, which has just been recently expressed to Dwayne through Frank when Frank is letting Dwayne understand that this nihilism, his, his, his negative approach to life, that's, that's not the point. That's not what this is about. You're missing the point about life. And he goes on to talk about the importance of the suffering that happens that helps define who you are. And that was a really big moment for Dwayne. That's his big breakthrough that we get when they're talking out on the pier that allows Dwayne to say to himself, you know, fuck everybody, fuck everything. If I want to fly, I'll figure out a way to fly. And that is a really big deal or these characters. One, Frank is there for Dwayne in the way that nobody else, the way that Richard couldn't, the way that Cheryl couldn't. And with that, Dwayne has picked himself up. At the same time, Frank has picked himself up. 
and then it culminates to that dance on the stage at the end. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 all about that suffering. And I have to say that, you know, I have thought similar things as well, that if I could go, could would you want to go back and change anything in your life? Would you, either one of you, want to go back and change anything in your life? That's a slippery slope. Yeah. I have always thought for a bunch of years, I wouldn't want to change a damn thing about myself because of all my imperfections, all of my shortcomings, all of my triumphs, they make me who I am today. And because of that, this is who I am. And I like who I am. And I think that if I were to wash away some of that, then I'm not me anymore. All of those setbacks, all of those frustrations, all of those wonderfully endearing moments that make me so euphoric and happy, having moments like this to do the pod, it's me. This is what makes me. So I got to take the good with the bad. I could have done without the heart attack. That, no. No. It Look, you're here with us, and we get to appreciate you that much more. Well. Do you appreciate me, Don? Well. Tell me how you appreciate me. Ask me again later. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting off topic, John. I I don't think I would change anything that's happened. Uh, are there a lot of things that we re- regret in life? Sure, absolutely. absolutely. A lot of stupid decisions mm-hmm. we've made, absolutely. But yeah. again, it does make you who you are today, and all you have is today. So, mm-hmm. well, let me you know, ask, make the best of it. Let me ask you both a second part to my earlier question. I don't my earlier question, my earlier part, would you let your daughters participate into a oh, right, beauty right, right. pageant? Copy that. The second part, I was kind of waiting until this point to kind of go with along with you're talking about, Ken, about changing anything. Would you let your daughters be part of a competition or part of a thing where you know they might get humiliated, they might get laughed at, and they're definitely going to lose? Or would you try to protect them? I... It, I think it would depend on the situation. It totally has to uh, depend on the situation. I, I believe that scenario can happen every time you play sports. Mm-hmm. Oh, you, you, yeah. You can totally, uh, I coached Elise and Logan for a long time, and I think I was more nervous when the girls played than when the boys did. Uh, turned out, you know, the girls were better than the boys, but that's a different story. So I think that, I think it does depend on the situation and you got to play it by ear Mm -hmm. for sure. But you know, when it comes to a beauty pageant full of, uh, you know, all this fakeness and, and that creepy look that, sorry, pageant people listening that have their little seven year old girls, but it looks creepy. It, the, the hypersexualization that happens to these girls, so you're both saying you would let your daughters go up on stage and strip to super freak no i would change the song for sure oh. not i'm not a big rick james fan so. so they would strip to something else sure okay and that strip strip i mean it was or funny less. though yeah the way she was grabbing at her clothes i mean she that was hilarious that and it was, was ironic good. that the audience thought oh, that looks awful i know these are the same people who were okay earlier on with their eight nine year olds going out on stage like in bathing suits to be ogled by people in the audience and being judged on their looks in bathing suits at that age. That, that again, that's probably to me where the movie hit a creepy point. Yeah. A little bit. Abigail Breslin's bathing suit was padded. Was it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. She wore a fat suit. Oh really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the, the dancing that Greg Kinnear did at the end there. Yeah. That was really hard for him to do. He has this huge phobia about dancing in public. And it all stems from his wedding day. His wife was merciless in making fun of his d- terrible dance moves. And so it, it took a lot of cajoling to get him to dance for that scene. I am of the opinion that, you know, you got hired to do this movie. Get on the fucking stage and dance. That's, that's what I would have said. That's about the size of it. And he did a good job. Yeah, he did. I, I bought it. All right, who whose dance did you like the most? They're all up there dancing. All of. Oh yeah, all of hands down. That took guts, kid. I am telling you, that took so yeah. much guts yeah. for her to get up there and do that. I loved Dwayne when he got up there and he just like looks at the audience like whoa, and then he's got that he's got that defiant look on his face when he starts dancing. Mm, mm, yeah, mm. yeah, <laughs> that was good. 
The family is next seen outside the hotel security office where they are released on the condition that Olive never enters a beauty pageant in California ever again. Piling into the van with the horn still honking, they happily smash through the barrier of the hotel's toll booth and begin their trip home to Albuquerque. Trivia. John, how many times are we shown them pushing the van? I would say there's at least five. Seven. The correct answer is is four. With one coast, we have four scenes of them pushing the van. Oh. I love I love the very first one. And what makes the very first one so awesome is when they get in, Frank is so pumped up. He was like, yes, that was excellent. Oh, well done, yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. Well done. You know, he was just so happy about it. And yeah. I, I thought that was really cool. Yeah. I kept wondering, how did he not burst his stitches? You know what? You just got to go with it, buddy. And then the road movie ends as a road movie should end. On the road. Yeah, it, it ends with us watching the van drive away on on an endless road. Did you either of you see the alternate endings? No. No. This movie? I actually found them on YouTube. Were they or they were checking out? Yeah. Well, there's actually two basic alternate endings. One, they steal the crown and are seen running out of the hotel, putting the crown on Olive as they all pile into the Volkswagen and drive off, and you get the same kind of seeing them driving down the freeway. The other one is uh, shows Cheryl standing at the door of the hotel saying, okay, it's clear, it's clear, let's go, let's go, let's go. And then you see Frank and Dwayne run out the doors carrying the giant trophy. Oh, that would... I and think then they that, pile into the, the I, Volkswagen. I can see why they didn't put it into the film, but I think that would have been a brilliant ending. No. Yeah. That yeah. would have been fun. But All of them end with them driving down the road. That doesn't fit quite what no. they were going for but it could no it could I, I thought the movie ended the way that it needed to end which is that they are back on the road in their broken little van their broken little volkswagen van heading off into the horizon oh 100 percent. heading back 100%. to bankruptcy and possible divorce and all of you having an eating disorder and, and you know what's great about that whole thought that you're having right now is as soon as i press stop or turn the channel I don't fucking care anymore. So they can go back to Hitsville or Splitsville. Doesn't bother me. I was thinking, you know, hey, Frank, the couch is open now. Edwin's not sleeping on it anymore. That was a good point. But he can't be left alone. He has to sleep in a room with somebody. That was the rule. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And plus him and Dwayne are getting along. So that's awesome. Mm -hmm. I like to think that they all live happily ever after. Again, this is one of those movies that doesn't need a sequel. So that's good. But I agree. That's good. They all live happily ever after, and that's the way the movie ends. And, yeah, you don't need the sequel. Just like Ripley and Newt make it back home, they live happily ever after with Hicks. No, they don't. Yes, they do. No, they don't. Yes, they do. No, they don't. They don't live. Newt and Hicks die. I'm sorry, buddy. But I guess, I mean, they're, they're uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but I, I do like that that last little bit of Richard putting the door back onto the van. There you go, you see? And so it, it's... It's that sense of optimism now that the family has. Sure. That, that they, you're, you're putting yourself back together. Life is going to be okay. They're on an upswing. Yeah. And, and, and it ends on, on, on a good note. Even though, you know, it's, it's not perfect, but, you know, everybody can relate to that because everybody has a family that isn't perfect, and that's the real world. If I was going to rewrite the ending, I would have had them go right through the barricade and then get stuck on traffic in the freeway and have Dwayne go, fuck! <laughs> Cut to black. Yep. All right, should we uh, rate this some bitch? Sure, how do we do our ratings? Uh, we rate our movies on a one to five scale, one being shit and five being not shit. Uh, and Five being a total dance-off to Rick James's it's, super freak. Yeah, it's super freaking awesome. I like that. Uh, and how we base it on is if we're channel surfing and a movie is on that we like, or if the movie is on, how long would we watch it? Would we stop and watch it for a long time? Would we watch it no matter where it's at uh, from beginning to end? Uh, would we watch it for a little bit and then maybe find something else. And so that's kind of how we are uh, rating our movies these days. Uh, all of our previous movies are on our website and they're or all averaged. And um, so, yeah, that's how we do it. Who wants to go first? Well, this was Ken's movie. We do that a lot. Can I go first? Yes, Ken. I would appreciate that. That's a fantastic idea, sir. 
this movie is s- such a rich story in how the characters are developed. Like I said earlier, the intro, I think, is a very strong intro. I really enjoy how each one of the characters in in all of their shortcomings and imperfections are introduced to us. And the journey that they have on the road to watch the transformation happen is is very satisfying. I really uh, enjoyed the the van with the whole bit with the clutch and then the, the stupid horn. And then when they get to the pageant and the door falls off, it's like, oh my God, how much worse is this going to get? But I loved their journey together and I find myself uh, enjoying several of the moments of the movie. Uh, Tony Collette did a great job and Alan Arkin totally deserving of his Oscar, but I really wish that Steve Carell could have had more props thrown his way because he, he did a, a super job, but you know, little all of Abigail, man, she, she was, she was the shining star of that story mm-hmm. and went on to be in zombie land. Yeah. She, she was, she was wonderful. I, uh, I, I have to give this movie at the very least, I probably go with a 4.5. Interesting. Yeah, there's a there's a lot that I really enjoy about this. Anything that Steve Carell does, I just enjoy. I I, I was absorbed watching Steve Carell. Yeah. yeah. You want to go or you want me to go? I will go ahead. All right, hit it, baby. When I first heard about this movie, you know, about a family getting into a Volkswagen bus and driving across country to get a little girl to a beauty pageant with all kinds of weird characters, I wasn't interested in the movie at all. In fact, this was probably my first time watching this movie the whole way through. Before that, I caught bits and pieces here and there, things like that. I have to say I was pleasantly surprised. I laughed a lot at this movie, especially every time that horn just kept going off. Mm -hmm. And my wife, Julie, she was rolling. She's seen this movie a number of times, and she was rolling during that whole horn honking scene. Just that little little prop, the whole time, just dying. But it's a it's a great movie, and it's well acted. You really get behind each of the characters, especially Frank. I really felt for Frank throughout the whole movie. Um, I was really proud of the family that no matter what came up, they accepted it. Mm-hmm. You know, Frank talked about his suicide; they accepted it. Frank talked about that he was homosexual; they accepted it. It was just a pleasant movie all around. Now, and for being a dark comedy, which I like dark comedies, um, you know, all these bad things happen. Maybe it's because I like seeing bad things happen. Maybe it's because I think, you know, the machine should win. I don't know. I'm pretty sure sure you just nailed it. But go on. But um, it was just so well done, you know, that the misery translated into comedy and it didn't you know you came across even though all these bad things happen and at the end what is really really resolved but you still feel satisfied you still feel fulfilled that they got to a good place rating wise if i was just gonna rate the movie as a great movie i'd give it almost top scores but if i'm gonna compare it to other movies when i'm channel surfing and i'm seeing what's in the guide and what's on I got to say, I'm going to pass it by. There's a lot of other good movies out there. If I'm going to pick between this one and Ghostbusters, I'm going with Ghostbusters. If I'm going to pick between this one and The Crow, I'm going with The Crow. Uh, Most of our movies, you know, I might watch this one for little bits and pieces. I got to watch Super Freak again. You know, it's little things like that that I would catch. So because of that, I'm going to give it a 3.0. 3.0. Not bad. Not bad. How much of it being a really good film influences that? score definitely would have been lower i would have given it a one or a two if it had been mostly a drama or just you know this dark kind of story that eventually just has a happy ending but the fact that they put steve carell in it the fact that uh, edwin was just so funny as the grandpa you know alan arkin and that olive did so well at really drawing you in the hug scene and things like that. That's what brought the score up for me because those are little things that kind of give you that, that warm feeling. Interesting. Which just curious. John isn't really used to. No, because I'm cold hearted. Yeah. Because the machines are cold. 
But I have been proven to have a heart because mine stopped. Well, that's still debatable. Fuck that guy. Fuck that guy. Fuck that guy. My turn. Uh, Little Miss Sunshine. Totally deserving of all the nominations that it received. Ellen Arkin was a gem. Steve Carell was fantastic. Tony Collette. All of them really did a fantastic job. Well written, beautifully shot, wonderfully scored. Solid, solid film. But I, I, I got to say, if, I, if I'm if i channel surfing, it's not going to be one that I just pop on. Uh, I will probably go through the rotation, and if I still can't find anything, I will come back to it. Because no matter where you're at in the film, I think you will continue to watch it and you know enjoy it. I, I think that if it was the only thing on, <laughs> I would probably watch it. However, all that being said, because it is so well written and so well produced and so well made... I think that I'm kind of with you on that, John, that I am going to give it a 3.0 as well. You're actually agreeing with me on something? I wouldn't say agreeing with you. I would say temporarily our interests have aligned. That's what I would say. So it's a team up. Eh, I, I wouldn't say it's a team up. I'm Batman. Hey, you're... even Superman and Lex Luthor have teamed up at times. True that. True that. And I'm Superman in that scenario. <laughs> yeah you are buddy are we ready to pick from the helmet uh i think so so for what uh people who are new to our show in this round of movie picks we always pick our movies randomly from a bronco helmet if you ever want to know why a bronco helmet you're gonna have to ask don but this time what we did is we drew out six movie genres and then we each picked three movies to go with one of those dramas we each picked one genres. movie per three total for each genre okay and what were our genres? I don't remember. Food, uh, road, road film. Road film, food movie. Western. Buddy, Western. Action. Period, piece, and action. Yeah. And so we each put in one movie for each genre? Yes. Okay. So you have picked, or you have had chosen Tommy Boy, which was your buddy film. It was my buddy film. And you, we picked um, Little Miss Sunshine as your road film. And we picked Once Upon a Time in Mexico as my action flick. And this week's pick is... The genre of the movie that we are seeing next week is a food movie. Fantastic. And the movie we are seeing, Ratatouille. Ratatouille. This is our first animated film. It will be our first animated. Who picked it? I'm guessing it's Ken. Yep. A good old film about rats in restaurants. Interesting. Ratatouille. And so when we were together and we were talking about our movies, so food movie, and then you, got, you put Ratatouille in there, didn't you, John? John says, no. And then Don turns to me and says, did you put Ratatouille in? And then I abruptly changed the subject. Well, so he didn't have to lie to me. Well, the funny thing is when we were talking about genres, we were giving examples of, oh, what would be a food movie? I think we all agreed Ratatouille is a food movie. And it's a Pixar film, which means it can't go wrong, which means chances are it won the Academy Award for Best Animated Film for that year. Quick, without thinking, what's your favorite Pixar? Go. Toy Story. Go. You thought about it too long. Yep. I would say Incredibles, mm. which I don't think is, but that's the first thing that popped into my head. Yep. So yeah, well, maybe we'll do a Pixar month. I'll have my answer by next week. Oh, shit. Yeah, I'll go ahead and hold my breath, buddy. All right, so that's going to wrap it up for tonight. Thank you so much to our one listener who listens to us. Where can they find us, John? They can find us at our website at threeguysandaflick.com, as well as any place, your favorite podcasting hosting sites. We're available everywhere. All right. Uh, for Three Guys and a Flick, my name is Don. I'm John. And I'm Ken. Thanks for listening. That girl is a super freak. I want you to know you're talking about a seven-year-old. <laughs>